Before I tell you guys about our research, I'd like you to think about the last time you forgot to eat breakfast. Think about a time when you were really, really hungry. You probably felt cranky, frustrated, became less picky about what you would eat, and eventually, you went and found yourself some food. In short, your hunger dictated your behavior. This is just an example of complex behaviors and emotions caused by a certain stimulus and caused by an internal state. But from a neuroscience standpoint, we still don't understand the genetic basis behind this kind of behavior, and we don't know the mechanism behind this kind of emotion. Two years ago, as a freshman, I decided to work in the David Anderson lab and was especially interested in Hidehiko's work on quantifying emotion. I assumed we'd be working with vertebrate brains to understand human emotion, so I was a little bit surprised to see this animal. This is a fruit fly, which is only about the length of our finger now. Although they're so tiny, hunger totally changes their behavior. If they're hungry, first, they eat more. And second, they become less finicky, so start eating whatever possible. And third, they move around a lot to find more food. So clearly, depending on their internal states, hungry or full, they totally change their behavior. Doesn't this sound exactly the same as Keitaki's behavior when she's hungry? <laughs> At first, I was skeptical. I didn't think an insect could have anything as complicated as human emotion. Or maybe I just wanted to think that I was more complex than a little fruit fly. And you're probably thinking the same thing I did two years ago. Why would studying a fly's simplistic behavior help us understand complex human emotion? In science, we always try to understand something complex by studying something simple. For example, to understand genetics, successful scientists did not study humans, but instead, they study simple organisms such as bacteria, fruit flies, and even viruses. What's amazing here is by studying these simple organisms, they found a lot of fundamental mechanisms which they could apply to higher order systems like human genetics. This is the beauty of the science. By studying something simple, we can understand something complex. So why don't we apply the same strategy to understand our emotion? If the fly had something similar to our emotion, it should be much easier to understand. First, because their brain is small, and there are a lot of genetic tools, as David just mentioned, and also it's cheap. So here, as you can see, on the left side, there is a part of mouse brain, which is kind of big, and just Next to it, on the right side, is the fly body. And the small structure just below it is actually the fly brain. I hope you can appreciate how small it is. So the next question is, if the fly has something similar to our emotion? We know that they have hunger, but what is emotion? The human brain interprets information in different ways, depending on its internal state. And this is a key component to emotion. In our everyday lives, we'll react to what we hear or see differently based on what we call moods. If you're really excited and happy before giving a TED Talk and a friend wishes you good luck, you'll feel encouraged. But if you're a nervous wreck before your talk and a friend says that same exact phrase, you're likely to feel even more stressed out. The important thing here is that fruit flies also change their behavior based on their internal state. We're not saying that understanding fly hunger can perfect our understanding of human emotion, but the mechanism behind fruit fly behavior might be evolutionarily conserved in humans. So the next logical question is, what exactly is this mechanism of state control in the fruit fly? It's the neuromodulator. Neuromodulators are chemicals in the brain, such as dopamine, serotonin, and neuropeptides. These chemicals act on local circuits to change their information processing, and also key targets for many drugs for mental disorder or brain disorder, and all together indicates that these chemicals are important for state control. Interestingly, fly also has neuromodulators. As you can see here in different colors, there are a lot of neurons express different neuromodulators in the fly brain. But as you can see, the structure is kind of messy, and there are a lot of neurons, so hard to understand what's going on there. So, although we know that neuromodulators are important for state control, we didn't know the detailed mechanisms. And one of the main reasons is because there is no good way for us to tell 
where and when the brain these chemicals are working. So this is why we decided to make a new tool to do it. We design a molecular sensor which detects and reports the amount of dopamine in the brain. And it worked. So this is one of the, the results we got. We are visualizing where in the brain dopamine is working in a hungry fly. The brighter color indicates more dopamine. So now I hope it's easier to understand. This tells that in a hungry fly, dopamine works only on a specific circuit in the brain. Now we have the entry point. Once we know where and when these neuromodulators are working, we can start using a variety of genetic tools applicable to the fly to figure out the function of these chemicals. These tools allow us to either activate or block certain neuromodulators and then figure out the function of the chemical. So what we'll do is see if a fly alters its behavior, either acts hungry or full, if we turn a neuromodulator on or off. If the behavior is different, we know that that chemical plays a role in normal feeding behavior. Using this approach, we found that dopamine works in specific sites and is responsible for the feeding behavior Hirehiko described earlier. Here's our strategy in a nutshell. First, visualize where and when in the brain neuromodulators are working. And second, manipulate these chemicals to see how they affect behavior. The mechanism here might be evolutionarily conserved in humans, because both humans and fruit flies share similar sets of neuromodulators. Two years ago, I knew I was interested in studying emotion, but I didn't realize that to study this behavior, I would spend countless hours starving and teasing and really giving flies a good workout. Last summer, Hidehiko had a bit of an unconventional sleep schedule. So I'd come into lab in the morning and leave around 6 p.m. He'd come in in the evening and leave around 6 a.m. And essentially, between the two of us, we were starving fruit flies almost 24 hours a day. <laughs> and now, every time I'm hungry and inevitably whiny, I can sympathize with the fruit flies that I'm starving and the genomes that I'm manipulating. <laughs> so. By taking the same strategy as we talked today, we hope that we will have full understanding of the state control in the near future. And perhaps one day, a scientist will come to the stage of Ted and start his talk by saying, scientists always try to understand something complex by studying something simple, like we understood our emotion by studying tiny flies. Thank you. Thank you.